And if you've got a Bible, turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter number 20. What an honor for me to be back in the great state of Wisconsin. I am so thankful that you invited a southern boy to come. Can, can y'all please forgive my accent? Is that okay? You can laugh at me. That's fine. Just, I'm going to say y'all a bunch. I hope that's okay. I come from the land of sweet tea and Walmart and fried chicken. That's home to me. In fact, now, are Walmarts a thing here? Okay. My people. So I pulled into a city one time, and the first thing we did is we found a Walmart because we forgot something. We walk into the Walmart, and as we're coming out, we buy what we need as we come out. We're walking out the front doors, and coming down the middle aisle of the traffic of where everybody's parking down the middle lane comes this. Now, how many of you know in Walmart, people don't dress normal? Some people don't act normal. He's coming right down the middle and he's in a motorized cart and he's driving this thing as fast as he can drive it. But here's the kicker of the story. As he's cruising or hauling or whatever you want to call it, straight down Main Street of Walmart, on top of his head, he's wearing a traffic cone. Now listen, I'm bald, and I've had to get creative with some hats sometimes. But this man, in his motorized cart, with a traffic cone on top of his head. And you know what dawned on me in that moment, Brother Herman? You know what hit me? It's right there as I'm watching that happen. This guy coming driving towards me. He does not care what I think about him. He doesn't care my opinion of him. I wish at Winter Youth Convention you would throw out the opinions and cares of the person next to you and you would decide this week at this convention I'm going to get everything that God has for me right here, right now and nobody or opinion is going to stop me. I want what God has. I believe it for you in Jesus' name. I'm so honored to be here. I'm glad that my family could come with me. My beautiful wife and my two oldest sons, Odin and Judah, are here. Ashley, Odin, and Judah, thank you all for allowing them to come and travel. There is one Smith that did not make the trip, and, and you are highly favored because we're going to put a picture of him up on the screen if they have it. Uh, if, they, if they don't, it's fine. I'll make sure I get it another night. But he, uh, he's three. And I'm not sitting on an airplane with a three-year-old. He's cute. We'll put, it up, uh, we'll put it up later. And you'll see that curly hair that he did not get from his dad. I give honor to Brother Booker and Brother Herman and the district board. Thank you all for allowing me to come. And to your great youth president and youth secretary... Brother Jordan, Brother Reagan, aren't they amazing examples, leaders, people? The youth committee, I give each of you honor. Thank you for allowing this opportunity to come. Got a lot of friends in the audience too. I'm thankful, thankful for that. Acts chapter number 20, beginning at verse number 7. I have one assignment tonight, and I believe that the Holy Ghost has prompted me to help prepare the way for the rest of the week. I feel like that is my job tonight. Acts 20, verse number 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together and break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. You guys ready for that? No, you're not. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there 
sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus being fallen into a deep sleep and as Paul was long preaching he sunk down with a sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead and Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said trouble not yourselves for life is in him and when he therefore was come up again and broken bread and eaten and talked a long while even till daybreak so he departed and they brought the young man up alive and then the one of the greatest statements in the Bible and they were not a little comforted and I think if you and I saw somebody die and come back to life we'd get pretty happy about that too I'm going to preach, teach, share the word of the Lord with you tonight on the subject, four chairs and a window, four chairs and a window. Can you set your Bible down and lift your hands up? Can you ask the Holy Ghost to speak to you? Can you ask his word to find a place in your heart? Can you pray and ask God to make you good soil? Lord, right now in this place, we're so thankful for your power, your presence, your spirit, so thankful for how you've worked so far God I am asking that you would prepare the way through tonight's word you would prepare for the rest of this week you would prepare the hearts and the minds of every youth and young adult here every youth worker here to receive what you are saying to them Lord I ask it in Jesus name and everyone said amen you can turn to somebody and say four chairs and a window. And you can be seated. I want you to find somebody next to you right now, somebody that you're comfortable with, maybe you're not comfortable with, maybe you didn't have a choice of the person that you're sitting beside, but you're sitting beside somebody and I'd like for you to make eye contact with them right now. I want you to look into those eyes. Now for some, this is an absolute nightmare. For others, you live for moments like this right now. And I want you to look right in the eyes. Don't look at me, don't look at me. You look at somebody beside you, there you go, stare right now into those eyes. And then you're going to say the phrase, repeat after me, you're looking at them. Say, you are just a pile of dirt. You are just a pile of dirt. You did not expect... Somebody would look you in the face and the eye and tell you that you are just a pile of dirt. You didn't expect that. You didn't come to church thinking that would happen. You didn't think that's how the preacher would open up. Which, by the way, can I just make an interjection? It is so good to have Brother Houston going to be preaching the pulpit. And from what I hear, you have to be bald to preach here. That's, that's what they say. So I'm thankful for he's 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 a dynamic preacher. He is going to he's going to bless you this week. You are just a pile of dirt. That's what you are cuz I didn't call you that. The Bible did. The Bible says in Genesis 2 and 7 and the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. In fact, God formed Adam or Adam from the dust of the ground. And the Hebrew word for ground is Adama. Man's garden was Eden. But God's garden was Adam. And when God decided... What he would make a person out of. He chose the substance of dirt. It's always been interesting to me why God would choose dirt, soil, dust to make people out of. Why that substance? Genesis 3 and 19. Till thou art returned to the ground, for out of it was thou taken. For listen, 
dust thou art, and dust thou shalt return. It does not matter how much money you have. It does not matter the car you drive. It doesn't matter your status in society. It does not matter. Everybody is made from the same thing. Dust does not matter your skin color. It does not matter your family background. Every person made by God was made from the same substance. So you better not look down on somebody beside you or somebody across the room or somebody in your community because we're all made of the same thing. Psalm 103, 14, for he knoweth our frame and he remembers we are dust. God could have chosen anything to make a person out of. God could have chosen any substance. He could have said, I'm going to make a human being and make them out of water. But the problem might be that water is a little too fluid. He could have said, I'll make them out of fire. And listen, there's some people. I think they are made out of that stuff. He could have chose rock or precious stone or diamonds or gold. He could have chose many things, but he chose from the creation of man to make them dust from the ground. So why would God choose dirt? Why would he pick dust, dirt, to make you out of, teenager, to make you out of, young adult? Why? Is that our makeup? Well, this is what I believe. I believe dirt is the only substance in the universe that can sustain and grow a seed. Soil and dirt contains the right balance of oxygen, carbon dioxide, minerals. It has all the right elements that if you take a seed and you put it into the ground and you do the right things with it, then you'll get the right thing out of it. So God wanted to make you out of something he could cultivate, he could work on, he could take and produce something out of your life. He chose a substance that if you put something into it, that's exactly what you'll get out of it. So I'm going to stop right here and tell you on this first night of youth convention, this is exactly why you got to stop listening to some music and stop watching some TV shows and stop watching some movies and cut ties with some friends. This is exactly why you got to stop some things because whatever you put in will always be what you get out. I need somebody to help me preach for a moment. I need a youth pastor for a moment. This is why it's so important what type of seeds get sown into your spirit. This is why it's so important what type of lyrics or thoughts or things come inside the fabric of your heart. You know why? Because eventually it's going to come out. Man's first job, Genesis 2 and 15. The Lord God took man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. The very first job God ever gave man was to take care of the garden. He wanted you to know how to take care of your life, of your habits, of who you are, what you allow in, what gets sown into your spirit. Let me tell you something. The serpent in the garden, when he was cursed, he was cursed down to the ground. And the Bible says he was sent to eat the dust of the ground all his days. You want to know why the devil feasts on you? You know what the devil feasts on? He feasts on flesh. He feasts on flesh. habits and fleshly ideas and fleshly terminology and fleshly ideology and fleshly relationships so he can feast even more on the things you're putting into your own soil of your life. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You're not smart enough to bypass God's law. You're not good enough to bypass God's law. 
You're not of the right pedigree to bypass God's law. Whatever you put in is exactly what you're going to get out. But this is so helpful. Because not only is this in the negative, but this is also in the positive. If you put the good things into your life, then you'll reap a harvest of good things. If you'll put the word inside of your spirit, if you'll start sowing the word inside of your heart, sowing the word inside of your mind, that's the type of things you're going to reap from it. If you'll make worship a priority in your life, you're going to reap a right attitude and spirit out. If you'll start sowing the right things into your spirit, you were made to produce something. So the question is, what are you producing? What's coming out of you? And if you, listen, if you want to, if you want to change, if you want to change the fruit on your tree, then you need to start changing the seed you put in the ground. If you want to change how you feel and what's going on around you, then you start changing some habits and things that you sow in so you can start getting the right things out. We've got to treat our lives as we were made. Jesus taught this amazing parable, amazing story in the Bible. He, he tells a parable about a farmer that went and sowed seeds. And the Bible talks about how there were four different types of, sea, of soil, four different types of things that he, Jesus, specifically listed. He talks about what happened in Matthew chapter number 13. He talks about what happens with these specific types of soil. There is seed that the Bible says falls on the wayside and seed that falls on stony ground and seed that falls among thorns and seed that falls on good soil. And he doesn't just leave us wondering what does this actually mean. No, he tells us the meaning of the story. The seed, ladies and gentlemen, is the word of God. And the soil is the person and how they handle the word of God. I'm going to take this for a moment and turn it in one particular direction and preach the remaining time that I have. The seed, or if I could call it this way, the preached word of God at this youth convention, at your church by your pastor and youth pastor. The seed has power. Come on, I thought I'd get a little better response than that. This book has the answers to your life. This book has the power to answer every question, every doubt, every dilemma that's in your life. This seed has power. Come on, the Bible answers the questions of today. The Bible answers the questions of tomorrow. The Word of God is forever settled, and it has power. The seed has the power. So the reality of this is, the question is not about the seed. The question is the soil. It's the life. It's the person right now in this room, in the Michigan ballroom, sitting in a chair, listening to a man preach the word of God. It is not a question about how good of a job I did or what scriptures were read or how he put the message together. That's not the question. Can we lay sermonizing down for a moment and just receive the word of God, not because it's me, but because it's powerful. And listen to me. It's not a question of the power of the word, but the life in the chair and what they decide to do with the word that's being preached to them right now in this space, in this room. Matthew 13, here's what it says. You can read it 
on the screen. The same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the seaside, a great multitude gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell on stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, but they had no deepness of earth. When the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. Others fell on good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Then he gives a description. He answers the question, what is this? What the, the disciples want to know, why are you teaching in parables? And he says, I'll give you the answer to that. Because some, as the seed, as the farmer is trying to sow, as the man of God at youth convention is trying to sow out some seed, there are people that will be like the wayside right here. See, here's the deal. There are four chairs on the platform right now. And they represent the lives of the people that I'm preaching to in this room right now. All of us will sit in one of these chairs. All of us will find ourselves in a place where we will sit and be one of these types of chairs. Our life will be positioned that way. Verse number 19. And when one heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then come the wicked one. And snatch away that which was sown in his heart. That this which he received is the seed by the wayside. The wayside is this, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pathway. It is a path that people would tread and walk on over and over and over again. So when the farmer would come, Brother Reagan, and he would take that seed and he would do his best to scatter it and he would do his best to land on that pathway, the problem was the ground was too hardened to receive a seed. The problem was the, the farmer's trying to do his job and he scatters the seed and it's laying there because it can't go any deeper than the surface. It can't go any further down to do what it was designed to do because the type of soil has been treaded on over and over and over and over again and the seed cannot find its way into the soil. Can I tell you there's people in this room right now, you are sitting in this chair and the pathway of your life and listen I'm trying to be your friend tonight and I'm preaching straight to you because I know I can feel it I know that there's young people in this room there's young adults in this room right now you don't care a lick about what's being said from the pulpit you don't care how it's being presented the seed is being thrown out to you right now and it's just laying on top of that soil and easily, easily, the enemy can come and snatch that seed away. And all of the potential, and all of the promise, and all of the hope, and all of the purpose of that seed is ripped away. Because the soil is too hard. The problem with the soil on the wayside is the pathway has been walked on over and over and over and over again. Let me tell you what I believe that this represents, what I believe this speaks to the person that sits in the chair on the wayside. Let me tell you what I think this is. Day after day and habit after habit and moment after moment and movie after movie and show after show and place after place and thing after thing. You have hardened the heart of your life over and over again and you keep walking by your decisions over and over again where the, the pathway of your life cannot receive the word. I'm being your friend right now, I promise you. But it's gotten so hard, they've suppressed spiritual habits. Their, their relationships prohibit them from connecting to God. Media stifles them hearing from God. 
Their appetites are captured by other things so they don't hunger for the word. It has no place for them. Their attitude is one of indifference. They hear, but they don't understand. I said, I, I know. I know this is tough. I know it's right. I know that I, 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 I feel led by the Holy Ghost. But I know this. I know this. I know this. I know this. There are people, youth pastors, I know you'd back me up on this. There are students in your youth group that you are wishing to God they would hear me right now. That you're wishing that they would hear so that they could finally open up and receive what God is trying to speak to them. Can I just tell you, if you're in this chair, tonight's your night to get out of that chair. Come on, tonight's your night to respond. Tonight's your night to open up. Tonight's your night to hear and receive the word. Come on, you can change your habits. You can change your choices. God is merciful. God is graceful. And God wants to meet you here. That's not the only type of person in the room right now. The Bible says there's another type of soil represented in the lives of humanity. It's called the stony ground. Verse number 20. But when he received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and immediately they receive it with joy. Yet, they have no root in himself, but endure for a while when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word by and by. He is offended. See, the problem, there are people in this room right now. Your life is conditioned and placed and positioned in the stony ground. Your life is in a place where there is a little bit of soil. But the problem with the stony ground is there's something underneath the soil that is stopping the seed from putting down roots. I'm preaching right now to somebody, some young lady in this room. There are large things underneath the surface you hope nobody ever learns about or figures out or learns about you or nobody would learn or, or pick up on. There are things, young men in this room, that you don't want some things revealed or shown. And there's large things underneath the surface stopping the potential and power of the seed from growing down any further and fulfilling its purpose. Solomon built a house for his wife. He married Pharaoh's daughter from Egypt, and he built a house for her. But the problem was, in the Bible, you'll read it, he built a house away from the temple, and he built a house that was separate from himself. He hid her away. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, if you have to hide it and you have to keep it from the unholy, you should not join yourself to it. Anything you have to hide is probably not godly. So it's time tonight to make up in your mind, I'm going to open up to God and reveal to Him and let Him deal. I think some of the things that plague youth and young adults, some things that lie underneath the surface that prevent the preached word of your pastor and youth pastor, the preached word of a convention coming into your heart and sowing down deep roots, I think a few things come along the ways. Number one, I think, is sin. But can I tell you, God is merciful. If you will confess your sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let me tell you something. 
You only have to do one thing, confess, and he does two things, forgives and cleanses. Come on, somebody here tonight in this place, you need to open up yourself to God. Let him come underneath the surface and pull those things out so the seed can grow. The second thing before I move on that hides underneath the surface of youth and young adults is unbelief. You believe it could happen for somebody else, but not for you. Can I tell you, that is a giant boulder of unbelief that lays under the surface of your heart. To believe that you're not good enough, you're not worthy enough, you couldn't receive anything from God. Let me tell you, that is stopping you from receiving everything God has for your life. And it's time tonight at WYC that you deal with the things underneath the surface. It's time you finally opened up To a merciful good God. I had a young person. Took the North American Youth Congress a long time ago. I'm old. This was like way back in the day. And we were, in that day we were in basketball stadiums. And this young person. He was a nice young man. Air quotes intended. It was tough. It was tough. It was tough to youth pastor him. It was tough to help him. He had all these opinions built up. He had all these ideas built up. And it was tough. He had not received the Holy Ghost as to this point. He's 15, 16 years old. And I walked into that fine, the, the hotel the final night. He had all his friends around. He was laughing. And he was, he was cutting up and probably saying things he shouldn't say. And I saw him in the lobby and something came over me, Brother Herman. I don't know if it was, I, I, I don't know if it was wrath or holy wrath. I don't know. But I looked at him and I pointed my finger right in his face and I said, "You are going to get the Holy Ghost tonight." And ladies and gentlemen, it absolutely shocked him. He didn't know what to say for the first time. He didn't have a comeback. We're about an hour into the altar call and that boy's sitting, we're up high because I'm a procrastinator. We're up high, up in the nosebleeds and that boy's about an hour into altar call and he finally lifts his hands up and he finally lifts his head back and he finally starts to open his mouth and pray and about... 30 seconds or so goes by and he starts to speak in a heavenly language that he's never learned before, that he's never practiced before, but he begins to speak out in tongues because somebody came and they dealt with the thing under the surface and pulled it out so the seed could grow. Then there's people in the room right now. The Bible talks about thorns. Ground that has thorns in them. And here's how scripture reads. Matthew 13 and 22. He also that receives seed among thorns is he that heareth the word and the cares of the world. Care of the world. The deceitfulness of riches. Choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. There are people in this room right now that have, because of their choices and their continual habits, they have hardened, hardened the soil and the seed is not able to get in. There are people right now, there are things underneath the surface that if they could ever get removed, they could finally put some roots down deep and grow. And then there are people in this room right now that you have allowed other things to grow up alongside the kingdom. And you have in your own heart and in your own way, you have made some things equal with the kingdom 
of God. Let me tell you the honest truth. Anything that you make equal with God's kingdom will defeat God's kingdom in your life. If a relationship matters to you as much as the kingdom does, that relationship's eventually going to win out. If sports or a hobby matter to you the same amount as the kingdom of God, then that sport or that hobby is going to win out and choke out the things of the kingdom of God. That's why the Bible says, Seek ye first. It is not a cliche. It's not a cute scripture. It is life or death for the kingdom in your life. Seek ye first. You've got to remove things that compete with the kingdom. You've got to take out things that try to come up and choke out your commitment and your dedication. Because they're just thorns. What is growing alongside your relationship with God? What is it? And are you dealing with it? Finally, before I go to my last story, is the good soil. It is the place that all of us should strive to be. It is the life of a person who is ready to receive the Word of God. Somebody who believes that this Word preached from the pulpit on this Wednesday night of youth convention is for them. You think this is for somebody else? Go ahead and go on home. But if there is a part of you that believes something's being said right now that's stirring up in my heart, Something's being said that was directly for me. That preacher doesn't know me, but something was said that got stirred up inside of me. Let me tell you, that's not just the preacher. That's the Spirit of God and the Word of God trying to confirm something in your life. Come on, somebody's got to start receiving the Word into your spirit. This is for you it's for you it's for you there's a story we read it at the beginning there's a story of a young man and I believe it best represents these four soils I believe it paints a picture for us clearer than many other stories in the pages of Scripture, it's a young man who's sitting in church on a day when the Apostle Paul shows up. And the Apostle Paul comes and he preaches a long time. The Bible kind of paints this picture that he preached for about six hours. Now, this is the normal place. Where the preacher gets up and he makes the joke. Like, hey, you guys want me to preach six hours? The resounding answer is... Gotcha. Here's the reality. Here's the point of that part of his story. Those people in the room... Those people sitting, listening to them, the Bible doesn't tell us all their stories, but the Bible tells us about one story. It doesn't tell us all the stories. The reality of that room is those people wanted to be there. And it did not matter to them the time. So I will tell you this, there's got to be something that raises back up in a generation that says, I don't care how long he preaches. I don't care how long he goes. I want the word in my life. I want the word in my spirit. I want him to sow something in me because I need the word. There's a man, a young man, named Eutychus. And Eutychus is in that room. And the Bible says that Eutychus has come. And he has sat. 
himself in a window. The Bible says they'd set many candles out and they'd made the room just right and got everything prepared and Paul is up there standing preaching and here's Eutychus sitting in a window. Now at first glance, that's not a big deal, right? It's just a guy, just a young man sitting up in a window. Not a big deal. Let him sit in there, that's fine. The Bible only tells the story of one, but Eutychus is sitting there and the Bible says that as he is sitting in a window, he begins to fall asleep. You need to know everything that's going on in this story. You need to know the context of what's happening. The man of God is preaching. And the young person is starting to fall asleep. And the longer he preaches, the more he starts to fall into a sleep. Until eventually, he falls out of the window. And dies. The Bible says he fell out multiple stories out of a window. And he died. There's so many problems with this story. So many problems with this this young man and what he did. You have the man of God preaching the word of God and teaching. And sowing the seed. Then you got a young person. Sitting. In the one place, you better listen to me right now, sitting in the one place that you can see everything happening inside the church and outside the church at the same time. And he has positioned himself in a place where he thinks he can have the best of both worlds. And I don't know if he's on the wayside, the stony or the thorny ground. I don't know. But I do know this. He has conditioned and positioned himself in a place that if he's not careful, he's going to fall. So I came on this first night with a warning, with a word for somebody, for a young person in this room. You need to get your life out of the window. You need to do everything you can to get your life back in an altar. You need to do everything you can to get back to a place of waking up and hearing the Word of God. This Word is for you. I have seen too many young people fall into a sleep While the preacher is preaching on doctrine, or the preacher is preaching on holiness, or the preacher is preaching on a topic, and I've watched young people drift off into an unconscious state to where they eventually fell. They fell into false doctrine. They fell into the wrong relationship. They fell into wrong habits. And it all could have been avoided. Let me pause right here because I feel it real quick. They had a moment ago, they had the youth leaders in the room, the youth pastors. They had all the youth pastors and youth workers, they had them stand. And if you don't mind, would you do that again for me? Youth youth leaders, pastors, youth leaders, would you stand? Can I just issue you a challenge real quick? Can I just say something from my chair and having just an opportunity to be in your district for just a brief moment of time? Can I just share my heart with you for a moment? We have to do everything we can to get them out of the window. We've got to do everything we can to get them out of the place where they're hanging on to both worlds. We can't sit back and just watch and let the entertainment go on and let things happen. We've got to do our job and get them out of the window. You can be seated. He fell and died because he slept through the preaching. And I preached this first night to you wonderful students with the call of God on you and a purpose that God has brighter and bigger than any generation before. 
I come to preach to you something very simple. It's time for you to wake up. It's time for you to open your eyes up, open your spirit up. It's high time for you to awake out of sleep. For now, now it is nearer than when we first believed. It is high time that this generation awakes to its potential and the promise and the seed of the Word of God that lays over your life. The prophetic utterances that have been preached and passed down. It's time for those to awaken in some young person. I'm going to ask the question on the first night and the altars are open. Who wants everything that God has for them? Who wants to see the potential of the seed come to life? Who wants to see the power of God? Come on, you don't have to wait on me to finish. Who wants it? Who's ready to get out of the wrong chair? Who's ready to get out of the window? Come on, don't wait on me or a song or a lyric. You lift your voice right now. This is your wake-up call, your moment. Come on, if you can't make it up here, then pray right there in a chair. Come on, that's it. Deal with those habits right now. Open up your mouth and speak them to God. I'm not going to go back to that. Come on, deal with the things that lie underneath right now. All doubt, all sin, all unbelief. Come on, make a commitment right now. I will not let this grow alongside the kingdom any longer. Come on, lift your hands up in the room higher. Fall down on your face. Would you reach for the one who made you to produce fruit? Come on, this is your first, the first night. But it's a preparation for the rest of the week. It's a preparation for 2024. How you respond now. Come on, youth leader, why don't you go lay hands on somebody in your youth group that's having a breakthrough. Come on, that's it. Lay hands on somebody beside you. Let's reach for the fallow ground to be broken up.
just want you, Lord. We just want you. We just want you. We just want you, Lord. We want a glimpse of your glory. We want a glimpse of your power. So take.
Come on, young person. Come on, somebody. I wonder if we can lift our hands again in this place. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, you are so good. Hallelujah. There's one thing on my heart right now. Is that if you wouldn't be here if God didn't have something for you this week. You wouldn't be here if God didn't have an opportunity that he is going to present to you. We just have to make our hearts ready for what God has this week. I wonder if we could one more time just lift our hands and thank God for what he spoke tonight. God, I thank you for your word. Lord, I'm thankful for the presence of God that we felt in this place tonight. Lord, you are so holy and you are so worthy. God, I pray, God, that as we check ourselves, as we check our spirit, Lord, that you would make our hearts ready. God, that you would make us, God, ready to hear your word. God, that it would permeate in our soul. God, that it would bury and it would grow and it would become who you have created us to be. Lord, I thank you for allowing us to be in this place again. Oh, God is so good. I wonder if we could just give him a hand clap of praise.